afternoon. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. And I'm really delighted uh, on behalf of the Ford School to welcome all of you here this afternoon for today's lecture. We're looking forward to hearing from a very distinguished policymaker, diplomat, and scholar, the ambassador and permanent representative to the Czech Republic, uh, of the Czech Republic, excuse me, to the United States, uh, Ambassador Martin Pavlosh. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Center for Russian and East European Studies, and I'd like to thank Chris for their support. Ambassador Pelush is here teaching at the Ford School this semester. He is our Towsley Foundation policymaker in residence. The, Har the Harry A. and Margaret D. Towsley Foundation policymaker in residence, that program was established in 2002 to bring individuals with significant policymaking experience to campus enabling them to interact with students and faculty. And we've had great success with this program over the years. I'd particularly like to welcome a member of the Towsley family who's here with us today, Jennifer Petit. It's great to see you. Uh, welcome, as always. Before taking his current post with the United Nations, Ambassador Pelosh served for five years as the ambassador of the Czech Republic to the United States. And as you can see from, from your program, he's had a long and very eminent career in both public service and in academia. He was one of the first signatories of Charter 77, a critically important human rights initiative within the Czech Republic. We were able to bring Ambassador Palos to campus this semester in large part because of his connection with Ford School faculty member Jan Spano. Jan could not be with us here today, but he certainly, <laughs> as you know, he has a very excellent uh, excuse. Um, he's one of the two final candidates for the presidency of the Czech Republic. He's actively campaigning as we speak. And I know that uh, Jan will want to view the lecture online once the election is over, and he's a little more control over his time. Um, I certainly would be remiss if I didn't send out both my personal greetings to Jan, and on behalf of the entire Ford School community, we are rooting for you. Um, we're very pleased and proud to be able to welcome Ambassador Kalosh here today, and uh, let me invite Martin, please, to uh, deliver his lecture. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, very nice introduction. First, uh, I would like to express my gratitude to the Harry and Margaret uh, Towsley Foundation and to Gerald Ford School of Public Policy for inviting me to Ann Arbor to become for a short time a policymaker uh, in residence at this great university. Thanks to all who have made my visit here or rather a series of quick visits in the six consecutive weeks possible, I have had a great opportunity and I've enjoyed this opportunity very much indeed. Uh, to interrupt at least for a moment my diplomatic business as usual in the United Nations headquarters in New York and to ponder on the matters I'm busy with in my daily routines and operations from an academic, which means not so much present diplomatic action oriented, but rather reflexive and historically informed perspective. As it has been announced, uh, I'm going to speak today about the Czech Republic in the beginning of the 21st century. We can start with a whole bunch of very general, I would say generic questions. Who we are now as a democratic body politic? How do we see the world today? What do we expect from the future? Where we want to go after we have become members of both uh, European and transatlantic structures, uh, the EU, European Unity, and the NATO, but being confronted together with our partners and allies, and also with all other democratic nations on Earth, with so many new threats and unprecedented challenges. As a collective of free individuals, we are obviously, we all obviously have our own specific visions, preferences, and choices. But still, uh, is there anything or what it is uh, like our common national will, volonté générale, today? So, what I'm going to, what I'm to, in, uh, what I'm uh, to intend to do here today, 
is not just to explain and comment on the basic elements of Czech foreign uh, poli uh, policy doctrines, as I would and should uh, do in my current official capacity. Instead, I want to depart here from a broader historical context and try to understand our current politics in the light of experience and self-understanding of modern Czechs, reborn as a European nation after times of darkness, to use the language of modern Czech historiography, in the last decades of the enlightened 18th century. So, uh, as I'm already indicating, I will bother you with uh, some bits and pieces of Czech uh, history as well. Uh, my apologies uh, need now to go to two directions. First, to those who are well versed or very familiar with uh, this historiography, so I will be maybe uh, repeating things they uh, know uh, very well. And to those who are not familiar enough with the Czech history, I will not say enough to be understandable enough, so let's hope it will work somehow. Uh, first, however, I simply cannot leave unnoticed in my lecture a big and hard event drawing attention of all of us, the presidential election 2008 just being in progress in the Czech Republic. Uh, as you all know, and it was said by uh, uh, Dean here by Susan, one of the professors of Charles of University of Michigan, both US and uh, Czech citizen, Jan Schweiner, is running in the election against the incumbent president Václav Klaus, it still remains to be seen who is going to prevail, how it's going to be cooked up in our parliamentary kitchen, which argument, the one emphasizing the experience and continuity of our way forward with what already has been achieved, Václav Klaus, or the other one stressing the need for change and for a new vision of our future, Jan Schweiner, doesn't sound a bit familiar to you? <laughs> Uh, uh, will turn out to be who is going to be more convincing in the eyes of the president's uh, electors. Anyways, uh, uh, what we can see here is certainly not only a duel uh, between two strong personalities and their programs and visions. In my view, and again, diplomat, either Václav Klaus or Jan Schweiner would be certainly a good choice for the Czech Republic. It is also, and I would say it is in the first place, as the evolution uh, in the last days or even hours, uh, and evolutions uh, uh, in the last days or even hours are nicely demonstrating a lesson in the today's Czech politics, or rather politicking in action. Uh, many eyebrows are risen now, watching this sometimes indeed an unusual spectacle as a diplomat, I certainly cannot comment on this one, but I would suggest even as an academic to stay calm, raise not your eyebrows, but rather the Masaryk's Czech question. In our actual situation, I will try to explain Masaryk's Czech question in a moment, and think through what we are doing as Masaryk was suggesting repeatedly in the world terms. To use it as an opportunity to understand better who we are, where do we stand, and what we want to achieve. Next Friday, which means today, from, uh, two days from now, we may know the outcome of this race, but one thing is sure already now as I speak. What is taking place in front of our eyes is the process of modern Czech political history with all its traps, challenges, weaknesses, ridiculous and absurd aspects and situations and perplexities in making. Uh, so if we may want to look closely enough and uh, watchfully enough and not to be uh, right away judgmental, we can maybe discover something interesting in this situation. But now uh, back to my theme. Uh, there are two sets of problems I would like to look at um, in my lecture. First, there's the question, uh, paraphrasing uh, efforts to understand a democratic society undertaken almost 180 years ago in the United States by Alexis de Tocqueville. 
What is democracy in the Czech Republic? What actually makes a difference between democratic processes in various countries, uh, thanks to the fact that nations may accept the essential, uh, uh, essentially the same or similar, which means democratic form of government, but still preserve their specific mentalities, historical experiences, myths, habits, and all other constitutive elements of what uh, uh, we call their political culture. And second, uh, how do these factors influence the behavior of democracies in the international arena? From Kant, we know already that democracies don't launch wars against each other, but still they behave uh, sometimes uh, uh, erratically on international scene as well. Uh, So-called national interests here in the United States are defined and formulated within the never-ending dialogue of your politicians, public intellectuals, journalists, pundits, and experts, or academics and experts of all kinds and colors. But what can be said about our specifically Czech climate of ideas? How do we perceive our position and role in the international arena? How do we discuss, define, uh, formulate, and eventually reformulate our goals, needs, and ambitions? How uh, do we take care about and push through our Czech national interests? How do we make our collective decisions and turn our political ideas into actions? And again, immediately, when I just started to bring together two different perspectives, I would say American perspective and Czech perspective, I spent in the past some time discussing about the differences between these two perspectives with American students. It's always challenging to think how does uh, the world look like from a position of a small nation if you are part of a big one. And still, if you are part of a big one, maybe with your own uh, worries and questions, you have no idea how does it look like from a position of a the other side, the big one. So it's very clear that uh, these things can sometimes look differently from different perspectives. And I would dare to say that domestic and international can have different distance uh, if you are, let's say, American or Czech. I would say quite uh, intuitively for Czechs, international is much closer uh, than uh, for average Americans. Even it could be measured, in my view, by distance, how far it is from your capital to your uh, borders, in spite of the fact that with Schengen borders now, uh, our borders, real borders, are pretty much far away as maybe yours, uh, your borders here in the United States. So uh, I think that this uh, comparison also can tell us something uh, about uh, my questions I raised, which are focused on the Czech Republic. So first, let me to comment very briefly, and I will try now to do a couple of very quick sketches, rather historical sketches here, because I certainly cannot uh, develop this theme. Uh, what can be said about democracy in the Czech Republic? And uh, I would like to start in this context almost up initio from the beginning from the moment when modern Czech nation uh, has come into existence. And I will be using uh, not a historiographer or specialist, but a philosopher, philosopher uh, who has uh, played quite, who played an important role in our political history in the 20th century, I mean Jan Patočka, who wrote a, a series of letters to his personal friend in 1969, 1970, which means right after one of the catastrophes uh, uh, of us during the 20th century, these years with eight in the end uh, uh, traditionally makes us of all alert. We had 1918 when Czechoslovakia came into existence, 1938 when Czechoslovakia uh, was dismembered after the Munich conference, 19. 48, when communists got into power, 1968, the Soviet invasion to Czechoslovakia, 
The question is how 1989 comes to it. If you turn uh, 89 upside down, you have 68. Uh, and uh, obviously now the question is what we can expect from this year, uh, 2008. And the question is what the uh, current presidential duel has something to do with this uh, uh, magic of numbers uh, we are so sensitive to. So Potocka wrote a letter to his German friend uh, under the title Vasim Chekhan. And uh, uh, it was, a, as he said, a concise uh, uh, overview of facts and an attempt uh, at uh, explanation. And I will uh, try to use that and I always, when I'm uh, uh, forced to mention it, uh, I uh, feel a little bit embarrassed by myself, but I have to uh, do it unfortunately. Because when Patochka thinks about the origin of modern Czech uh, nation, uh, and he is looking at this uh, uh, process that was, or that is in historiography, uh, called Czech uh, national renaissance or rebirth in the last decades of the 18th century. Uh, so he, and I will be quoting from him, and you understand me right away, the Czech nations, Czechs are a nation of liberated servants. They did not liberate themselves. Uh, they didn't carry out any great revolution, uh, such as uh, that which brought the great American Republic uh, into existence. Nor did they experience anything similar to French Revolution. Rather, than they, uh, there were, uh, there, they were liberated by an act of emperor. Um, I'm not going to go to details here, but a question uh, to liberate oneself or being liberated uh, I think it's uh, very uh, relevant, even if we want to talk about our own so cherished uh, revolution we are proud of, the Velvet Revolution. Did we liberate ourselves, or were we actually liberated by an act of emperor, whoever the emperor at that moment was? I think it's a very relevant question. And Patochka, uh, just uh, because uh, uh, us modern Czechs, started from rather different set of ideas uh, than uh, the ideas that animated American Revolution. We, did, we do need to follow or watch or observe the process of political emancipation and let's say modernization of Czech nation very carefully. And then eventually, if we then want to speak about the similarities and uh, cooperation between Czechs and Americans, Try to understand, start from this tangent. And again, I can only indicate rather than explicate here. Czech Americans, those Czechs who traveled to America, I think have uh, very much contributed in the 19th century to uh, building a, a kind of uh, common sense uh, I would like to talk about uh, uh, later during this uh, lecture. Patočka said that uh, Czechs were reborn from below and the endemic uh, quality of them is their smallness. Uh, smallness not only in the terms of numbers, it's, uh, as Patočka says, kind of quality. Uh, being reborn from below, which obviously has some disadvantages. Till now you can uh, see Czech politicians criticizing themselves for their own parochialism, provincialism, uh, closedness, uh, too much of uh, pragmatic adaptability, Schweikish uh, uh, tradition. Uh, in the Czech uh, context can be certainly also mentioned here. But as Patočka rightly says, this uh, uh, element the fact that Czech uh, were reborn from below has some advantages as well. Uh, isn't it a, uh, I would say, solid reason why we can easily say that Czechs are really a born democratic nation? To be uh, reborn from below uh, means that you have some sort of sensitivity from things coming from below. 
Uh, and again, I uh, can only indicate and not explicate, if you want to think until today about the differences between Czech, Polish, and Hungarian, for instance, political behavior, this uh, aristocratic romantic element uh, that uh, was very influential, uh, important factor of uh, Polish and Hungarian politics in uh, centuries of modernization is rather absent uh, on the Czech side. But Czechs uh, 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 having these uh, um, democratic foundations uh, quite successfully uh, um, uh, transformed themselves from an ethnic group to a democratic, modern, political nation with some future, or not only common past, common language, but future-oriented projects. Again, I'm not going to go into details uh, of uh, evolutions of Czech society in the 19th century, but Czech society was step-by-step uh, step developed, transformed into a solid middle-class industrial society, the emphasis on civil society or uh, associational structures. These intermediary bodies Stockwell was talking about was always very strong in the Czech Republic or in uh, Bohemia, in our Czech lands, rather to say. The role of education and culture uh, was uh, extremely important. So this would be a first sort of historical lesson or picture we need to have in mind, I think, if you want to answer the questions I tried to raise at the beginning. Having said that, second step is quite logical, and I will still stay uh, in this context, is typical Czech question is how this smallness uh, can be overcome. Uh, uh, what we can do to make us a little bigger. The uh, first and most uh, typical uh, thing for the 19th century Czech society uh, in process of modernization is ask historiographers to find something big in our past, uh, to bridge the gap between modern and pre-modern Czechs by coming up with certain version of Czech history and pick up Charles IV, uh, Jan Hus, uh, Hussite movement in general, as great predecessors and inspirers of modern Czech nation. Obviously, this uh, uh, history of speculation can be sometimes problematic, but I think that this is a typical part of our uh, identity and modern tradition. But then we can go on and on, and I certainly can't do that, just names. Uh, Komenius, great Czech of the past, Palatsky, Havlíček, already great Czechs, uh, historians and politicians of the uh, 19th century. I'm uh, just uh, running, you know already where I'm running to, Tomáš Garik Masaryk. Because if you want to think about a person who was really greatest challenger of this Czech smallness, and someone who was already uh, preparing Czechs for their future, and their version of Czech democracy and Czech, reaction, uh, Czech concept of international relations, it was him. Uh, Czech question was the typical, is a, was a Masaryk uh, uh, opus. And uh, as he always liked to say, Czechs do need to be shaken out of their shells and think about their Czech question in worldly terms. What exactly does it mean? It still uh, can be debated. Masaryk liked to go as professor against the current. He was a great uh, advocate of uh, uh, women's emancipation, for instance. Uh, his uh, role in the uh, process of Hilsner is known, and his actions in, uh, uh, in uh, Vienna, in uh, 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 is also uh, uh, notoriously known. But obviously the most important thing uh, Masaryk did in his efforts to turn to uh, the Czech question or to think about Czech question in worldly terms was his foreign action and his uh, uh, political action that brought in the end to Czechs and Slovaks 
their independence in 1989, uh, 1918. So Masaryk, I think, is the person who uh, really opened both Czech democracy as a domestic factor and Czech democracy as an international uh, uh, factor. And I will now quote from the Masaryk's uh, New Europe. Uh, I like that uh, part very much because it demonstrates very well, uh, uh, I would say, strength, but also weaknesses and fallacies of uh, the Masaryk's concept. Uh, New Europe was uh, his uh, booklet written under very strange circumstances uh, in trains uh, uh, on the ships when he was traveling from St. Petersburg uh, through Russia and Siberia to Vladivostok and then to the west coast and of the United States and to Washington. And then it was re-edited later when he was already as president uh, traveling uh, uh, back to Europe. Masaryk wrote there, the history of Europe since the 18th century proves that given their democratic freedom, small peoples can gain independence. The World War was uh, the climax of the movement begun by the French Revolution, a movement that liberated one oppressed nation after another. And now there is a chance for a democratic Europe for freedom and independence of all her nations. So uh, this was a part of the Masaryk's foundation. Uh, democratic ideals, humanity, as Masaryk liked to say, and a strong belief that uh, European history is also uh, this kind of linear, linear movement that started with French Revolution and was liberating one nation after another and uh, guaranteeing almost that in a new century that started with the First World War, small nations can gain independence. You already uh, can intuitively feel what the problem is. As Jan Patochka uh, again uh, uh, said when he criticized Masaryk not for his philosophical action, uh, for Patochka Masaryk was the greatest uh, thinker and statesman we have ever had, no doubt about that. So it was that unfortunately he reflected on this event uh, that we, he called the World Revolution, the first or the Great War as it was called then, uh, using the concepts that were borrowed from the past from the 19th century, and something escaped his attention. Something escaped his attention that uh, sim uh, simply left his state unprepared to meet challenges which were coming from the future. I am stressing this point right now because we might be tempted, and we, have, we were tempted in 1989, certainly, to uh, uh, adopt the same enthusiastic uh, uh, state of mind. Uh, we found ourselves in a very similar enthusiastic state of mind, maybe as people in 1918, believing that the progress now uh, is bringing us uh, something better, something uh, what we might have known from the past, and that uh, we are not so uh, or still maybe we are so not ready for uh, threats, questions, and dangers coming from the future. I could now easily just reconstruct what was the uh, basis of the Czech or Czechoslovak foreign political doctrine in 1918. Uh, actually, uh, this piece I mentioned, New Europe, is, uh, uh, I would say, its uh, basic formulation. Masaryk believed rightly so, that uh, small states or smaller states between Germany and Russia need to have some, I would say, basic stabilization. And he was looking at the other axis, north, south. That's why he was looking for uh, his partners uh, uh, in neighborhood uh, uh, where he could find some patterns for cooperation. He, and uh, it's interesting comparison again, 
he had an American wife uh, as our current uh, candidate, uh, uh, he was strongly convinced that uh, American uh, presence in uh, the shaping of Europe and of the world is of key importance. His Wilsonianism, if I can say so, was certainly a basic feature of his understanding of international relations. But uh, as you know, what then happened uh, uh, later with uh, this uh, vision, this view, the League of Nations, uh, which was uh, uh, the most important child of uh, President Woodrow Wilson, uh, first of all, the United States uh, never became a member of this organization, and that it turned out that it was not strong enough uh, to do what it was supposed to do to prevent uh, armed conflicts and wars. So uh, uh, the construction from the very beginning was uh, kind of standing on uh, sands and maybe later in the 30s on the quicksands. And the second, I would say, fallacy, maybe not fallacy, but uh, not uh, well thought out uh, uh, thing was democracy in the Czech Republic, in, Czech or in Czechoslovakia in that moment. Obviously, uh, and again, I'm not uh, going, I cannot look at in detail to the political life of the First Republic in the 20s and in the 30s. Uh, party politics may be similar to the one which uh, we can observe uh, today in uh, the Czech Republic. And uh, I would say uh, a nation of liberated servants, again, in a very uh, typical uh, Czech action. Please don't uh, misunderstand me. I don't want to criticize as a sort of idealistic uh, um, uh, uh, admirer of Masaryk, but the Czech politics, Czechoslovak politics in these years uh, uh, was driven as all uh, democratic uh, uh, political uh, uh, communities are by their small petty interests uh, absorbed in their small petty struggles and seeing maybe details and sometimes overlooking the whole. What I am going uh, just to maybe uh, point to, but certainly I cannot uh, analyze that, Czechoslovak ex democratic experiment ended tragically uh, and the Second World War that started in a way with the dismemberment uh, of Czechoslovakia brought the end, I would say, to the Masaryk's hopes and aspirations. And a uh, quick sn uh, snapshot as a contrast to the Masaryk's uh, definition of Central Europe, where he said why he thinks that Czech independence is. Uh, okay. Do I miss something? No. Uh, indispensable. What uh, Milan Kundera had to say about uh, Central Europe in 1984. Uh, Central Europe, as a family of small nations, has its own vision of the world, a vision of deep mistrust of history. Uh, the Masaryk's, quotation from Masaryk is full of trust in history, that history really can liberate one nation after another. History that goddess of Hegel and Marx that incarnation of reason that judges us and arbitrates our fate. That is the history of conquerors. The peoples of Central Europe are not conquerors. They cannot be separated from European history. They cannot exist outside of it, but they represent the wrong side of history. They are its victims and outsiders. This is the uh, 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 article published by Milan Kundera in New York Review of Books in 1984. 
under the title Tragedy of Central Europe. And basic idea is that this entity, uh, Masaryk tried to stabilize, was disappearing from the history. We were part of Eastern Europe, behind the Iron Curtain, with all implications. And certainly this would be interesting also to raise these questions, what uh, did democracy mean at that moment in the Czech Republic? Uh, uh, democracy of a closed society, democracy where everybody, or almost everybody, went to regular to ballots and uh, was confirming uh, the leading role of the Communist Party, not because of conviction, but because of fear and uh, uh, necessity. International relations uh, well stabilized, after all, with uh, uh, the Western powers uh, sort of consenting that uh, actions uh, in the Soviet zone are, I would say, a domestic matter of the Soviet rulers, as it turned out was the case of 68. And out of sudden, 1989, uh, liberation. I already mentioned we can still think and debate whether we liberated ourselves this time or were liberated. Whether it was, let's say, Havel and Valenza who did it, or Reagan or uh, Bush 41, uh, and uh, uh, Gorbachev, who met, if you remember well, in the fall of 1989 in a uh, military vessel somewhere in the Mediterranean around the island of Malta. So uh, some journalists started to speculate from Yalta to Malta. And it's still unclear what maybe their arrangement that moment was. But uh, uh, it's a matter of fact that from this moment on, the question what the democracy is in the Czech Republic uh, was given a new meaning. What uh, started in that moment was politics of transition with all these aspects, both domestic and international. And I think that if we want to look at them and think about them, uh, I think that uh, these historical facts and experiences are worth of being remembered. And uh, uh, we need not to forget uh, uh, that uh, maybe some of the questions we are now uh, uh, trying to answer were raised and answered before us. First important question, I think, is danger and maybe both positive and negative aspects of similarity between uh, our previous liberation in 1918 and then 1989. I think that it could be, if I had a, uh, some uh, chart, it would be possible to demonstrate that uh, uh, 1918 was a real transition from the world of the 19th to the world of the 20th century. Maybe Masaryk thought that this would be kind of extension, linear development, but the world of the 20th century in many, many ways, uh, technically and uh, in terms of players and dangers was different from the world before. Powers uh, still thought in the beginning of this great war that it would be short, blitzkrieg, uh, something uh, uh, that would only restore uh, a balance of powers in Europe. And then it turned out that this event was irreversible, that it brought effects uh, that we could not go back. What about 1989? I think that it is very uh, fair to raise a question. Is not this date the end of the 20th century? 20th century as a politically stable entity, and that the transition that came after that is uh, just already beginning of something new, uh, beginning of a new era, the world of the 21st century, and then we can dispute or debate uh, what are the uh, real events in which this century has announced itself with all new threats, dangers, and questions. And I think that if I look back uh, on our political 
concepts of 1989, it took us some time to get the message that uh, we wanted to return to Europe. But the problem was there was no place to return to. Uh, everything was first in flux. Everybody would tell you that basic goal of our foreign political uh, uh, endeavors was to integrate ourselves to the European and transatlantic structures. We did. The good news is that we are now part of it. But uh, both systems have changed dramatically and radically uh, 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 with us. And uh, we did not return to them, but we are now uh, with them in a very new situation. The second thing which I think is extremely important uh, uh, for us is uh, the role the United States played in this process. I understand that you can have here, uh, not only in connection with your presidential election, but in general, uh, all sorts of disputes about America, the US role abroad, and uh, I can go on and on. But I think that in our part of the world, without uh, clear commitment, and this commitment was made, and I remember that very well because I was accompanying uh, President Václav Havel in his first trip to Washington in February of 1990, uh, 1990 I actually was preparing this trip, commitment uh, to help post-communist countries in transition to make it. Without this commitment, we would not have made it uh, to NATO and to the European Union. Uh, just a side commentary. There are many, uh, maybe, disputes uh, and discontinuities in American foreign uh, policies. But uh, the idea of Europe whole and free, uh, this is the idea, or uh, it is a term used by this president, is something what he took from his predecessor with eight year, years when Clinton uh, was in the White House and uh, Madeleine Albright was Secretary of State. And again, uh, uh, President Clinton uh, had inherited this task, this goal, this uh, uh, obligation from his predecessor, which was uh, Bush 41, uh, the father of the current president. Not speaking for ourselves, but for New Europe, if you want to say, I think that there are still countries, uh, Georgia, Moldova, uh, and a few others, Ukraine, uh, uh, bigger and smaller, that are vitally interested in uh, this continuity. Uh, uh, that are not so much, I would say, obsessed with uh, Democrats versus Republicans, blue versus red, but with this, uh, uh, with, uh, this presence uh, of America in uh, our part of the world. This is uh, something uh, what sometimes, uh, when it is politicized too much in the present context, can uh, get lost, uh, um, uh, covered by all sorts of ideological arguments. But if you look at this historical perspective, and this is again part of, I would say, continuity of our foreign uh, policies, that uh, it's good uh, when America and the United States uh, are European power. It's uh, for even good for the European integration. I would say that those who say that we are either with Europeans or uh, with Americans, that uh, developing ties with the United States means to weaken uh, European uh, uh, project, that is plainly wrong. That, and maybe you can take it as a provocation, I think that uh, in the same way as uh, Marshall uh, Plan helped European integration in its beginning, Still, uh, the fact that there is here uh, the discussion concerning transatlantic cooperation is helping, Europe, uh, uh, helping European integration now in the beginning of the 21st century. Obviously, uh, and uh, uh, maybe 
same uh, danger, same fallacy as uh, Masaryk had to cope with, which means to understand and to draw right implications uh, after the Great War, after which Czechoslovak state emerged, is our own problem as well. I think that, and I don't have time for that, if we wanted to look at the transition after 1989, where we were, uh, where we are now in 2008, with all new elements that have not been in place, we really must be able to find a way how to understand these new questions. It's sad that part of our, I would say, orientation in the beginning of the 21st century is the strong emphasis on human rights. Indeed, it is true, the Czech Republic, in comparison with other member states of the European Union, is very outspoken and active as far as the human rights situations in sometimes far away and distanced countries, Burma, Myanmar, Cuba, closer to our uh, uh, country, Belarus. And if we do Cuba, for instance, uh, some people can say, American luckies. You do that uh, in the same way as uh, the United States uh, are trying to uh, define its Cuban policies. I'm here not to comment on Cuban policies of the United States, but uh, what uh, I think we are trying to achieve is not only uh, payback uh, in, uh, I would say, acts of solidarity. Uh, uh, we uh, experienced and uh, received as a source of strength uh, uh, in times of our need. I cannot just go into details, but human rights policy, in my view, is today the most important or one of the most important heuristic uh, instruments. How to identify, gauge and label new threats, uh, uh, they are coming, because many of them are rather invisible than visible. And when they are visualized or turned into something, uh, I would say, already very efficient and very, eff uh, very uh, threatening, it can be uh, too late. Uh, we can obviously talk about what are the dangers today. Climate change, terrorism, this is what uh, is uh, the uh, situation, uh, uh, what, is, uh, what the debate in the United Nations is about. Sure, uh, uh, very true, but I think that what is a bigger danger is the way how we talk about these things, uh, the way how the discussion is structured, uh, lack of moderation in uh, uh, these debates as far as the uh, uh, opponents' arguments are concerned, and lack of solidarity. I think that here, small states cannot do much. Uh, we can be very happy that we are uh, in the EU and uh, NATO, because these are our basic uh, security guarantees. But I think that our history uh, has uh, taught us quite a lot uh, that uh, for small nations, question of their freedom has never been fully resolved. Uh, that we need uh, to not only to remain alert, but to remain active, uh, to think what can we do uh, within uh, the European Union, bandwagoning is maybe the easiest uh, uh, option, but uh, not, uh, I would say, the safest one. And uh, the same thing is uh, in uh, NATO and in uh, all other international frameworks we are part of. I would like to conclude uh, with that. The good news now is that uh, we made it. Uh, we are free, and I can stand here and talk, and uh, we can have this open discussion.
At the same time, the world has become and is becoming more and more a dangerous place. Small and big nations, uh, they have different uh, ways how they can fend off, uh, conf be confronted with dangers. Small nations uh, certainly must be more creative, more alert and conscious of their own history. And let me to go back in the very end uh, to the presidential election 2008. I think it's uh, really uh, thinkable. The outcome can go this or other way. As I said, I think for the Czech Republic, both candidates uh, certainly can uh, be good presidents. But main question is, and then I will not disclose my uh, priorities here, is what we are going to get in the next five years. If the situation is relatively calm, uh, and that's what we want, I think that uh, disputes and skirmishes within the Czech borders are going to be rather ridiculous, entertaining part of our, I would say, democracy or daily life uh, democracy. But other question is, we are in the year with eight in the end, that uh, from time to time, big events can come, decisions uh, uh, in which countries like the Czech Republic will be again standing on crossroads and will, would, ha would have to make decision. And this is a big question. And here, I think, uh, the presidential election of 2008 is uh, quite important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Kolesh has agreed to take some questions. Yes, please. Please, sir. about putting the two countries back together. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I was asked to repeat uh, questions because uh, these questions are not uh, taken by uh, Mike uh, that well. So the question is to bring back the United States and the Czech Republic together. <laughs> Slovakia and the Czech Republic, okay. Look, uh, because of uh, uh, limited time I was given uh, to this presentation, I basically didn't speak about Czechoslovak relations. And here, I, but, but here I think is only, uh, what I have to say is only good news. Uh, maybe one of the problems of us is of the Masaryk's uh, legacy or his policies uh, after the First World War was unability to resolve question of coexistence of nations uh, Czech Slovaks, Czech Germans, and uh, all other uh, combinations in our part of the world. As it is known, a Czech Velvet Divorce took place after the Velvet Revolution. But where we are now, both the Czech Republic and Slovakia are in the EU and in the NATO. After uh, some uh, years in which we had to pay price, and Slovak certainly paid bigger price for the separation. Uh, relations uh, just got to the current level, and correct me whether I'm wrong, but I think that Czechoslovak relations have never been better uh, than today. Uh, the permanent Slovak problem of being independent and not to be tutored or mentored by uh, all the brother Czechs has disappeared and still Czechs and Slovaks can cooperate. Czechoslovak economic cooperation is very significant. There are no borders between Czechs and Slovaks. And still Slovaks uh, feel, uh, I would say, very close relationships uh, with Czechs and vice versa. So uh, uh, the idea of Czechoslovakia, I think, is still alive, uh, even without uh, the existence of that state. So uh, I don't think that we need to go back. 
we need all, uh, I think what we need more is to remember together. Uh, Jan Patochka uh, wrote in 1968 an article, it was the spring uh, of Prague, or Prague Spring, about Czechs and Slovaks. And he said something very beautiful. He said, uh, why do Czechs need Slovaks and vice versa? They need them to learn the truth about themselves. Uh, uh, you need sometimes a partner, a mirror, uh, someone uh, with whom you eventually can quarrel, dispute, but think about uh, uh, things from a different perspective. Obviously, uh, it's not uh, always uh, the easiest thing to do. But I think that in the Czech, uh, case of Czechs and Slovaks, it is working. Yes, please. There's some globalization of industry in the Czech Republic, uh, Volkswagen acquired Škoda, if I recall. Uh, how do the Czechs, in general, view this trend of globalization? Uh, so the question is uh, the Czech perception of globalization, and uh, uh, the question also goes to the, I would say, economic aspect of it, uh, big international uh, companies uh, in, in the Czech Republic. Uh, first of all, the Czech Republic, I think, uh, is one of the biggest benefactors so far of, uh, I would say, a certain aspect of globalization uh, in terms of uh, foreign direct investments. I think per capita, uh, Czechs uh, are in the top uh, echelon uh, in Europe. And obviously, Volkswagen, Škoda is one of the uh, most visible examples but there are so many others, uh, uh, surprisingly, not uh, only in the area of traditional Czech industries, but uh, the Czech Republic has become, I would say, high-tech uh, uh, superpower. Uh, so many computer companies now uh, operate uh, from the Czech Republic. It's not only uh, assembly lines for computers, but software uh, productions and service centers. Uh, so I think that in this uh, aspect, globalization has worked for us uh, pretty well. Obviously, uh, each uh, side has its flip, a coin has its flip side. Uh, shoe industry, for instance, almost uh, been wiped out. Uh, traditional uh, Batya uh, traditions because of the uh, cheap commodities, cheap products, cheap merchandise coming from China or uh, other places. So what is the, I would say, challenge for the Czech Republic is, I would say, knowledge-based economy, uh, higher value-added uh, uh, products. Uh, uh, our uh, original, um, uh, I would say, comparative advantage was cheap labor. Uh, do we want to remain a cheap labor country? Uh, it's a matter of uh, perspective, uh, who works uh, in these uh, facilities, he want, or she wants to have the highest possible salary. So salaries are going up, uh, and uh, there is a concern, are not going, uh, are not these uh, international investors going to go somewhere else uh, where the work is, uh, or labor is cheaper? Uh, something is happening, but in that respect, globalization has been working us pretty well. But obviously, globalization is not only that. Globalization is, uh, uh, I would say, uh, maybe uh, common awareness of common threats uh, and uh, be it uh, uh, non-state actors uh, and uh, climate uh, situation, infectious diseases and uh, uh, all uh, consequences or implications of the fact that now the borders are uh, much more uh, porous or uh, uh, since uh, nine, uh, since December of the last year we live in Schengen zone, which means uh, uh, no border with the exception of uh, airports whatsoever. And uh, so this is a new situation and for Czechs, as I said, uh, a landlocked country, uh, small uh, people, uh, they can from time to time have uh, uh, difficulties with that. But younger generation obviously is uh, in a very different situation, living in a different world, 
It creates some social problems as well. Cohesion of families is certainly affected uh, by the fact that young uh, generation lives in a different world from uh, the world of their fathers or grand, uh, grandparents. But uh, I think uh, the Czech Republic is rather a uh, fortunate uh, place so far. Uh, um, I don't want to be cynical, but obviously uh, we are, can uh, be resentful that we have no uh, sea, uh, that we are a landlocked country. But uh, in the cu current climate, it might be an advantage. <laughs> yes, please, in the back. <laughs> okay. So uh, we have already been playing uh, some role uh, since uh, our entry in 2004. So the question is the, our role, the Czech role in the European Union. Uh, formally, we will have a, a quite visible and uh, important role a year from now uh, when we will have the presidency of the European Union. And uh, so then uh, the answer is... Uh, uh, this question is answered by this very fact because the presidency is a great uh, responsibility. Uh, it's a very active role and it still remains to be seen whether we will be uh, living to uh, not only our but uh, all others' expectations. Uh, certainly our uh, role is, um, uh, depends or is, corresponds to our power uh, to our prestige. Uh, bigger countries uh, in the EU are, in a way, uh, because they are bigger, they are more influential. But my personal experience uh, in New York and everywhere is that it's interesting that the European Union really is a democratic uh, place. Uh, small countries uh, have their voice, uh, can influence others, as long as they say something, what makes sense? Uh, as long as uh, their uh, political strategies are sort of uh, powerful enough, uh, you simply have to live uh, in a company of 26 other members. Uh, uh, there are some questions that are, I would say, explosive and divisive. Uh, it's not so much, I would say, uh, transatlantic relations, uh, as far as the relations between EU and the United States, obviously there are different uh, schools of thought and differences, uh, political differences, but I think the level of unity is relatively high for all sorts of reasons. It's known fact that the um, volume of foreign direct investments uh, going both ways is, uh, well, speaks for itself. Uh, if you compare it with anything, comparable, China, India, so uh, the real partners is here, the Europe and the United States. But if you speak, for instance, about the membership of Turkey, uh, uh, the, Turkey the accession talks uh, with Turkey, uh, you can, I would say, get too much more uh, 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 divisive uh, uh, discussion. So Czech Republic can do a lot. Uh, uh, the question is uh, who we uh, are going to choose as partner. We have traditional partnership with our uh, neighbors, with Visegrad Corporation. Obviously, uh, countries of, I like to use this term of new Europe, countries connected with certain experience, uh, can eventually from time to time be partners. But uh, in certain situations, just give you examples from the United Nations, when it comes to Israel, Israeli um, uh, resolutions, uh, Czech Republic is known as a, one of the most pro-Israeli uh, country in the EU. And our partners, who are uh, allies in this debate, is the United Kingdom, and the Netherlands, and Denmark. Uh, I'm not criticizing others, but uh, you always need to know how to play the game, and you need to play it well. And, uh, you need to be prepared. <laughs> okay, lady, over there. What would the adoption of the euro affect the Czech Republic? Well, first of all, uh, the euro uh, adoption uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, uh, there is still unfinished political debate when. Uh, they are uh, quite influential politicians. We can start with the current president, uh, who is not uh, enthusiast as far as 
uh, euro is concerned uh, for all sorts of reasons. And uh, the argument would be not to rush with the decision and not to postpone it. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, your own uh, monetary policy is an instrument how you can uh, regulate uh, macroeconomics, uh, which means that as long as you need that instrument, uh, then obviously it makes sense. On the other uh, side, uh, the, uh, uh, one has to recognize that uh, um, if you want to keep your crown in a, a region where everybody uses euro, it will cost you a lot of money uh, because you would have to cover all transactions. So I think that from the point of view of uh, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, the sooner we are uh, adopting euro, the better. But obviously, uh, many things already have happened. Uh, now, most of the transactions between banks, uh, they, are, they obviously use euro as uh, their uh, currency. Uh, but uh, my guess is that uh, our time uh, will come, uh, they speak about uh, to, uh, 11, 2011, 2012, I mean. I think uh, uh, obviously it also depends on the ability of the government uh, to uh, put to order public finances, uh, to have, uh, I would say, balanced uh, budgets, and this is a politically very sensitive issue. Uh, I think that when the moment is going to come, Czechs would not cry for crowns, uh, as, as far as I know, uh, no uh, country, uh, no city. Uh, uh, citizen, uh, citizens of no uh, European countries, when it happened uh, in Germany or France, uh, uh, had uh, <laughs> tears in their eyes when they were losing their uh, marks or francs. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, still it will take some time and the ability of our politicians to uh, arrive at consensus in many issues, including e uh, Euro, uh, is kind of uh, limited. So, Michael. I always admire how you can combine your intellectual and philosophical background and your statesman's background, your uh, performance now. And I wonder if I could ask you to do maybe the most difficult thing, and that is to comment on the uh, US anti missile radar station in the Czech Republic, but through the eyes of Hannah Arendt. And in the following sense, would Hannah Arendt be able to talk about this issue in a way that would allow us to think about this installation in a different way, and that might not be the foundation on which the communists will ultimately support Jan Schweinar for president? <laughs> Look, uh, maybe I will uh, uh, not disappoint you, but I will lose my credit uh, in your eyes. Uh, when I say now that I am uh, very much in favor of this uh, uh, American military installation in our country. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think that it's very difficult uh, here to make distinctions. And philosophers in Ireland especially are strong in ability to make distinctions. I think that what we need to agree, what I would agree 100% is, as I said already during my lecture, uh, the necessity of American presence in uh, uh, our part of the world. Uh, on the technical side, uh, the question is what is the best uh, way how to achieve that. In that respect, I'm not that strong uh, expert uh, in uh, anti-missile defense uh, systems. And I can understand that uh, the debate needs to be kept open and that uh, it's certainly important what uh, uh, the next U.S. administration's decision is going to be concerning uh, the whole thing. But what I know is that in Brussels, especially the Secretary General of the NATO, he is very much in favor of uh, bringing this uh, system into the NATO defense structures. That uh, the game played by our communists and unfortunately social democrats is uh, in many ways, I think, irresponsible. Uh, I'm not asking them to uh, uh, rush to their decision too soon, but not to close uh, their door as they seem to be doing right now. Uh, and I'm not going to 
uh, repeats uh, the question that the Russian Federation is the threat or uh, that it is a threatening country only. But obviously, uh, we have our historical experience uh, being bit sandwiched between Russia and Germany. And uh, we seem to be in that situation again, uh, given the uh, energy uh, uh, situation and policy. Uh, so I think, uh, and uh, I think that and it can really be proven uh, very concretely that without the US participation in the European debates uh, concerning the European political arrangements and uh, defense, uh, um, we would uh, be in much worse situation. So I think that uh, this need to be uh, said, but if you can, if you can articulate that philosophically, uh, I am not that sure. I think that uh, Hannah Arendt would be certainly very critical as far as some political debates here in this country, no doubt about that. But at the same time, I think that she would not cite uh, one-sidedly uh, with uh, uh, the others as well. Uh, the last evolution in Prague, as far as the, this debate uh, related to Jan Schweinar, the Green Party, as I uh, read two hours ago, uh, has said very clearly that uh, this is not negotiable. They are not going to uh, uh, trade uh, the presidency for a political decision, uh, no matter how important such a decision uh, it is. So there is a no trade here, and uh, actually our commentators say that uh, Mr. Philip, the uh, uh, chairman of the Communist Party, just uh, overplayed, uh, uh, overplayed it because now the ball is back on his side. He can either, and he could do that with or without radar discussion, uh, to let uh, the other side to be elected, or he can uh, make up his mind, but Greens are not going to uh, make any uh, trade. And maybe Hannah Arendt would be, would be very happy about that. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Yes, please. Um, uh, you talked about human rights in Russia, you talked about Burma, you talked about Cuba. I read an article about a month ago about the repatriation of uh, the North, Car North Korean population of the Czech Republic back to North Korea. Can you talk about that? Well, Look, uh, let's uh, make, uh, the question is uh, the Czech human rights policy and the repatriation of North Koreans. Uh, the, uh, you know, uh, this is a uh, difficult situation. I, I will give you one other example of what we have been doing as far as North Korean situation is concerned. Uh, because these uh, individuals have uh, not come to the Czech Republic as uh, asylum seekers. Uh, they themselves didn't ask for anything like human rights protection. Uh, they were brought uh, to the Czech Republic from our point of view on their own, uh, basically, uh, to uh, work in uh, the Czech uh, uh, factories. And then it turned out that these groups of people among themselves uh, uh, were practicing uh, things that are simply unacceptable in the Czech Republic. You know, these uh, uh, ladies working in uh, uh, factories were simply exploited by their uh, commanders and bosses, and uh, uh, so they were in this situation. So uh, the, first, the only decision that was taken is to, uh, uh, to end with this type of cooperation because this was rightly so criticized that these people uh, uh, were treated uh, on the Czech soil in a way which was not consistent with uh, human rights and uh, international labor uh, standards. But uh, then what to do with them when you cancel these contracts? Uh, these people, uh, if they uh, escaped and uh, approached the Czech authorities and asked for political asylum, they certainly would be uh, given a chance to make their argument, but to my best knowledge, they didn't do that. So, it, uh, so this is a very, very strange situation. On the other hand, uh, maybe as a kind of apology, um, the, what I see as a very tragic situation as far as the North Korean uh, situation is concerned is that powers and uh, on the level of the Security Council, they are ready to discuss one thing only nuclear program and uh, the threat 
imposed by North Korea uh, just building their nuclear facilities. And the fact that this country is uh, organizing uh, almost uh, holocausts on their own population uh, is uh, sort of, uh, and that uh, the uh, now uh, doctrine that has been adopted and is being developed in the UN system, so-called responsibility to protect, according to which the governments ha have obligation uh, not to expose their own population uh, to situations that can threaten their uh, death and disrespect their dignity, uh, such as famines, uh, are, I would say, seen as a clear violation, uh, not only of international law, but uh, a threat that can lead uh, to conflict and aggression, and then the Security Council is uh, uh, legitimate uh, to act. Uh, so what happened was that uh, there was a report uh, well documenting the situation there, published by an NGO or by a group of lawyers, and then it was sort of signed by three individuals, uh, Václav Havel, um, uh, Magnus Kjell-Bondevik, former prime minister of Norway, and Eli Wiesel. And uh, the idea was to present that report uh, to the member states of the United Nations. And uh, it's not uh, that automatic thing uh, how to do it, because only member states have a right to organize events uh, in which eventually some, anything, something can be presented. And we did it, uh, because there was no other country uh, ready to uh, expose uh, member states uh, to this, I would say, uh, shocking uh, information uh, contained in uh, uh, this uh, report. Uh, maybe it's too little, uh, but at least uh, some, something. Uh, there was, there was, uh, I don't know what to say more. I could speak about human rights uh, at length, but I don't know how much time do we have. Okay, so who, who wants to raise the, okay, please. Um, I don't want to ask you to make a diplomatic statement or a government statement on this, but rather if you could give us a sense of what you think the Czech person on the street, the average Czech person, thinks about the possible accession of Turkey into the EU. And in particular, I'm wondering whether the sort of concerns that you hear in England and France, not only about labor, but apart from the labor issue, that this might threaten the historical meaning of what Europe is, or might threaten the Christian history, if not the religious <laughs> practice of... Look, um, I really uh, don't know. I can only speculate. The question then, again, is uh, well, what would be the average uh, person's reaction to the Turkish case, Turkish accession to the EU. But uh, several things I can say. First of all, uh, the Czech Republic Unfortunately or fortunately, uh, so far, has not ma uh, made any uh, big experience with this minority. Uh, they are, there is 0.01% uh, of Muslims living in the Czech Republic. So certainly you cannot compare that with uh, France or uh, England or with Germany, where, where the Turkish minority is pretty strong. Uh, so in that respect, uh, I would uh, expect that Czech reaction would be, I would say, less informed, so maybe less panicky, uh, more uh, rational, but uh, I'm not uh, guaranteeing that Czech average person would be, in that respect, uh, less xenophobic uh, than he or she is under normal circumstances. And obviously the question is how this uh, case would be presented. If uh, this would be presented as a part of campaign, uh, so that we need to uh, isolate our, ourselves from all these threats coming from other civilizations, so then can e easily get the support of uh, you know, Czech population for all these anti-Turkish uh, uh, com campaigns. At the same time, I think that if you want to explain it uh, uh, in different terms. Uh, well, I think the American argument would be that both NATO and EU need to cover basically similar region and uh, uh, Europe, Holland, Free needs to have 
Turkey for strategic reasons, because then obviously you have the uh, Trans-Caucasia uh, partly covered. It's, uh, it's a matter of uh, situation of countries like Azerbaijan uh, and uh, alternative pipelines. And, uh, uh, you know, Turkey is basically controlling the old Silk Road. Uh, in a way, and uh, the, uh, or it's not far from there, and it is a uh, strategically important line. Uh, but uh, my own point, uh, I would add one more thing. I studied at length uh, um, uh, uh, in the context of public international law or human rights law, uh, Article 10 of the European Convention, freedom of expression. Uh, and if you look, for instance, at the case law, uh, just for your information, there is a 363 cases that were decided uh, substantively by the court. And 182, more than half, slightly more than half, is Turkish, uh, of Turkish origin. So you can see how Turkish courts then deal with these Turkish issues. And if I compare the Turkish approaches uh, to uh, now sensitive questions of this head, uh, scarves uh, and others, if I compare the Turkish approaches with Russian approaches. So I think that uh, Turks are much more open-minded partner. Uh, uh, and uh, they are really ready to uh, accept, uh, I would say, jurist uh, prudence, uh, which is being uh, uh, developed or built uh, by the European Court for Human Rights. So I think that there are many, many arguments uh, uh, in favor of Turkey. And I'm not sure that if we want to translate it into this traditional conflict between Christian Europe and Islam, uh, that we would gain uh, in long-term perspective uh, very much. Because uh, the situation of the 21st century is most likely very different from all uh, previous conflagrations between Christian and Islamic civilizations. But obviously, we need to be sensitive, I think, to the arguments coming from uh, these uh, uh, questions too, whether Sharia is really compatible with uh, civil law as it is being uh, understood and practiced in European countries, and whether Turkey is uh, really going or still keeping, uh, uh, to rem uh, is going to remain a secular state or uh, whether this Islamist government can uh, eventually uh, turn it into something else. Open questions, and I think that we will need some time uh, to come up with better answers. But if it, uh, uh, this question came to vote now, I think that France would be no uh, very clearly, and many other European countries as well. Okay. There's a reception in the Great Hall. I hope that people will stay and join us for further discussion.